What up fam? This show was extra special for me because I had the pleasure of having childhood homies and award-winning filmmakers John McCarthy and Roddy Tabatabai. They are the co-founders of Change for Balance, a full-service strategic communications and production agency. These guys are on a lifelong journey to change the world for the better. For the past 15 years, they have traveled the world to capture untold remarkable stories of courageous people, organizations, and charities dedicated to positively impacting the planet and all of its inhabitants. With clients ranging from the Charlize Theron African Outreach Program to Prince EA, American Heart Association, Virgin Unite, Amnesty International, and UFC, they have led international productions to create high-level quality content for film, television, social media, and other digital platforms. Their work has received more than 1 billion online views, including creating the most viewed video on climate change ever. Their first feature film, Love and Bananas, played in theaters around the world and was awarded the Humane Society of the U.S.'s coveted Film of the Year Award. We discuss the emphasis on cause and purpose-driven media as content is a tool. We discuss the emphasis on cause and purpose-driven media as content is a tool to not only raise awareness but to drive tangible and measurable impact. We also shared a lot of laughs because frankly, we like to have fun. So guys, if you enjoyed this episode, please share with a homie and definitely subscribe. Boys, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Hell yeah, I love being here, like in your studio. This is epic. It's great we're to have you. to have you. Yeah, yeah, I love it, I love it. So we're for big anyone, fans of what you're doing, man, so we're honored yeah, to be here. Thank on. you, boys, and I'm a big fan of what you guys are doing. And uh, for anyone that doesn't know, so we all went to high school together. Yep. We went to high school together, and one of the first things I asked my guests is, I asked one of my guests, when was your last oh shit moment? But first I wanna actually, I wanna reminisce, and I think I've told you this before, Roddy, but. One of my clear memories of high school, I had this memory that for whatever reason, like your stomach was always fucked up and and we were at your house and I just have this clear cut image of you chugging Pepto-Bismol out of the bottle to the very end. And so I think I might have blocked that out, but (laughs) dude, it's so funny. We try to, I mean, we don't really try to explain this to people, but like a lot of people that we meet through work see us as kind of these like, I don't know, empathetic, really sensitive, like filmmaker guys. But I'm like, dude, in high school, we were kind of menaces. Like yeah. Roddy was gnarly, especially in high school. And we were like, we we're football players, man. We were jocks. Yeah. yeah. It was pretty funny. I had a little Napoleon thing going on in high school. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one thing I love is you could be all the things. You could, could be, be all, all the things. We're just multifaceted humans. 100%. Yeah, dude. yeah absolutely. So yeah. when was your last oh shit moment? Rod, was the first thing that comes to mind? Oh shit moment. I mean, every day. You know, I mean, there's there's things you got to navigate. Things go wrong all the time, and you just gotta do your best to come out on top. But as far as oh shit, I mean, looking back, nothing's an oh shit moment. Everything is like a blessing, right? Even the worst backstabbings or whatever you can think of serve you in one way or another. I mean, I truly live my life that way. Even the worst things that have happened to me, when I look in hindsight, it's like wow, that was protecting me from something. That was guiding me towards another thing. Yeah. That was introducing me to another person, opening space for something new. So it's hard to say an oh shit moment. I'd have to think about that. Could be good, oh, actually, too. an oh shit moment. I got a good one. Last night. <laughs> <laughs> See, I knew. Just got kind of something. <laughs> I was on, I, I do stand-up comedy. Last yeah. night, I was on stage and absolutely bombed. So really? That was an oh shit moment. And that's an oh shit moment that you're stuck in for about five to eight minutes. You can't get out of. <laughs> you know you're going to bomb. You're going to try to get the crowd back. But... It kind of, it, it happens right off the bat, right? Like, it just starts that way? You can way. tell. It, and a really seasoned comic will know how to turn that room. But, you know, I had a tough set last night. So that was an ocean. We're going to talk a little bit But more again, about that. <laughs> looking back on it, it serves you. Oh, yeah, got to improve. Yeah. Got to write. Got to work harder. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. John, what was your last hell yeah moment? Oh, hell yeah moment. Yeah, I'm switch it up on you. Like you already that. had the oh shit ready. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was thinking, because I was trying to define, like, what is oh shit? Like, oh shit. But I've had some, like, oh shit, hell yeah moments. Oh, yeah. Recently. I mean, Let's go. I'd have to say the most recent one is probably just when I finished the half marathon. That's, like, the first thing that comes to mind. Congrats. Because I was in brutal pain the entire time. I <sighs> entered it with an injury. I didn't train. And I got, to, and I was at, like, mile eight. I was like, I think I'm going to Uber. And I just kind of beasted it out and got it done. Threw in David Goggins and it was just like, I can't be a bitch today. So <laughs> got it done and I was That's just like, That's amazing, oh, man. Congrats. Oh, yeah. That's one thing that I haven't been like, I would, 
I don't even know if I want to, but like, you know, I mean, I train a lot and I'm in shape, as you guys are both. Great shape. But I can't imagine like, like a marathon, like, like, or even a half marathon. It's just, I feel like it's so mental too. It's so like, I don't even, I don't know. I don't think I could do it. I disrespected the distance. I was like 13.1 really? minor. Like I just, I could go on a jog and bust out like 10 or something like that. So I was like, who cares? Oh. What's three more miles? But it was, it kicked my butt. Man. So when I got done, I was like, hell yeah. Let's rewind a couple of months to another hell yeah moment that I, as your partner, I want to brag about. Yeah. Sure. I admire it. The, the paddle. Mm. That was a big hell yeah moment. I paddled from Catalina to Newport on a prone paddle board. So just kind of head down like this. Another one actually where I had a really weird injury. And then, um, but it was all for the Ben Carlson Foundation, which is uh -huh. raising money for lifeguards and like underprivileged lifeguard stations in Nicaragua, Mexico. Um, so it was great. It's a huge accomplishment. I'm proud of it. That's amazing, man. Yeah. That's awesome. And after that, that was a huge, so we pull into Newport and it's a huge like community gathering event. So like, you're paddling, you're paddling, and there's all these people on the pier, and as soon as you get close, they just chuck beers at you. Oh, really? And they open this Pacifico, like this warm canned Pacifico, as soon as I pulled up, and I'm like so dehydrated and salty. <laughs> it was honestly the best beer I've ever had. Best. Yeah. I love that, man. Yeah, and that was a hell yeah Those moment. traps must have been so sore the Bro, next year, right? jacked. <laughs> That's why, yeah, I'm like some of my favorite photos are after love that event, because I'm just like... <laughs> That's epic. You were in good shape for that. Yeah, I was in good shape. So, Rod, you started doing stand-up, which is epic. It takes a lot of balls to do that, man. I started and with John, actually. What's that? We started together. Oh, nice. Yeah. Why don't, that, you, why don't you just start us off with a kickoff bit? Give us a bit. <laughs> what, do you, what do you do like those, like, like I, I can't wait to see. I haven't seen you yet, but like, what do you do, like, like Jerry Seinfeld stuff? Like, what's the deal with corn nuts? Like, well, what kind of shit do you do? You know? well, like, this might come to a surprise, but... I don't give my material away for free. You're gonna have to come to a show. <laughs> or subscribe to his OnlyFans. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, so guys, is video the best way to bring awareness and inspire change? And whoever wants to take these questions, we could just, you know, popcorn it. Absolutely, Johnny. I like that I question. Like Johnny's answer is my favorite. I like to watch, take notes, and then go home, recite it in the mirror, and try to do it as good as he does. So let's let <laughs> 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 um, is video the best way to create change? To create awareness and inspire change. Yeah, I think 1,000%. Well, I think story is, right? Okay. Um, and we were talking about, talking about this a little bit like in the like pre-show kind of deal, but um, whether it's, I think video is like the, the delivery mechanism of our time that works best, but what you're ultimately delivering is a story. And story is something that is baked into our DNA to respond to, right? Like before we had written language, we told stories about where to hunt, about what to eat, what will kill you, what won't, and cave paintings were like the first kind of stories, right? When someone tells you, hey dude, I got a story, you lean yeah. in, you listen. And there's this thing that happens that's called narrative transportation that sucks you into the story. That's the gold standard. When you're feeling the emotions, the highs and the lows, um, there's this thing that we talk about, I can't remember who said it, but our buddy Prince EA says it all the time. The longest journey you'll ever take in your life is the journey from here to here, mm. right? From your head to your heart. Yeah. And a story is actually the shortest way to get you from there to there. Mm. So as filmmakers, as storytellers, our job is to take viewers from their head into their heart because we want to inspire change, right? That's mm -hmm. why we started our company, is to make the world a better place, Yeah, uh, to bring balance to it. Yep. We can only do that when people are operating in their heart. Yeah. Yep. We always say that awareness is the bridge to action. You know, like if you don't know about something, you Impossible. can't do anything. Yeah. And like, you know, they always say people hear facts, but they feel stories. Yep. Mm -hmm. You remember a story. You yep. want X number of people in this area are suffering from this that comes in one year out the other. Yeah. But if I tell you a story about a young girl in South Africa and what she's dealing with on a day to day, you're going to remember that. Yeah. So those stories are the way that we connect with our viewers and inspire change. Yeah. I mean, there's science behind this. People make decisions with their emotions and not with the rational side of the brain. hundred percent. Absolutely. Yeah. No, we're way more rationalizing than we are rational. Like you make the decision and then you kind of rationalize it. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. you can play on that. That's cool. And I mean, there's all sorts of stats, right? Like that we use when we're kind of marketing or trying to sell, like right. viewer, uh, a user of a website will spend 88% more time on a website that has a video 
on its homepage. Mm -hmm. Like there's so many stats to back up why video is sort of like the, the method of our time um, or of this generation especially. Um, but it's clear that really at the end of the day, it's, it's yeah. the story that's being told that will, you know, whether it's us as filmmakers wanting to inspire change or whether it's a brand or a company that comes to us wanting to tell their story to connect them with viewers to engage sales or drive up donations. Yeah. Telling a, a story is the way to do that. Absolutely. You're right, Rod. That was a really good answer. Like that may be have that that may just be something that we cut up for real later because that was perfect. And you may have to go practice that shit in the mirror. To be honest, <laughs> I've, that was good. I've heard him do it better when he's trying to sell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It depends. It depends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. How are people using video irresponsibly? How are people doing it the opposite of what Change for Balance is doing in terms of raising awareness and inspired change? I think that goes back to our origin story, really, yeah. and what inspired us to start That's Change really for Balance. One. Okay. So it's 2008, 2009. It's the, you know, the shock and awe campaign, the war in Iraq, um, you know, the war on you know, weapons of mass destruction mm -hmm. soon after Afghanistan and all these different ways that media was being used to spread different types of propaganda, whether you want to believe in it or not, that's not what we're debating, but it's just like the way that the media uses this type of storytelling and playing on fear and emotions, mm -hmm. that's a way that it was used, and we were seeing it in real time, unlike any other time in history, I mean, at least in our short history on this planet, uh, and that we said, wait a second, if they're using these tools to persuade people to live in a state of fear mm -hmm. and panic, right? Can we also use these tools to inspire hope, inspire change, inspire transformation yeah. and of global consciousness? You know, so that's really where Change for Balance came from. We said, I think we can use these tools to create change. Okay. And John and I grew up together. We were in, you know, went to kindergarten together, in middle school, high school. Um, college roommates, and we separated for a little bit, went on different paths, and then met back up. And was that like a little bit of a breakup? Was that awkward? Or it was actually a nice break. It was a but nice we needed break. it. You know? needed it. You made just stronger, and then you come back together. Yeah, yeah. What, but no, what it's is, true. I mean, like, it's crazy because we we're the same age. So obviously, we grew went to school together, so we have all the same kind of shared experiences, or at least context for yeah. moments in our lives. Yeah. It was wild when we graduated. I mean, unless you had sort of like a clear cut, I'm an engineer, or like you had right. a master's or a PhD, if it, there was nobody knocking on your doors for jobs. You know, my first job was in finance in 2008 was the banking crisis. And then, you know, you I got- I was in real estate in 2008, the <laughs> yeah. worst time in the history of real estate. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I, we remember in college watching Operation Shock and All, like it was like a freaking Michael Bay movie. Like it's, it was nuts and you saw like, the rise of these like just so polarized, vo polarized voices, especially on social media, speaking to their own echo chambers. And yeah, I mean, when we saw the power of media to separate and divide, we're like, mm -hmm. the power has to exist for it to also unite. I love that. Because at the end of the day, we're all in this leaky canoe together. Yeah. So we have to work together. I love that. Sayings. I had to make sure we squeeze the leaky mm -hmm. canoe in there. <laughs> What is that like to be business partners and best friends? You guys have known each other forever, like you said, you're best homies. That's gotta be tough sometimes, right? Like what is the best and worst of it? It's a good question. I mean, the best is the unshakable trust. Mm -hmm. Like I know this guy to his core. Yeah. I know what he's made of. Um, and then the worst of it is you know each other to their core, you know? So you can't bullshit. There's no sliding by, you know? Yeah. Like I can't make it up. Be like, ah, it's just gonna like, it's like, no, I know you're better than that. Do better than that. Mm. That's and, good. And, and that's guys, good. And you guys feel, you guys are good about calling each other out on that, in, in that sense of knowing that somebody could do better and pushing them to grow. Yeah, I think so. And it's not even always verbal, it's energetic, you know? And we've gone through a lot together. We've done spiritual healing together. We've been through some of the highest of the highs and the lowest of the lows. Yeah. Uh, and, and I mean, like we've been in scenarios where like, fuck man, we could die here. Like we were being followed once <laughs> in the red square in Russia. And like we had like a, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollar camera and I was carrying a tri <laughs> tripod. John was carrying the camera and this guy was following us. And I was like, John, if this guy comes towards us, I'm gonna have to crack this guy with the tripod. And then we're gonna have to run. So like, you know, and then we were in the De Democratic Republic of the Congo, 100 degrees, like close to 100% humidity in a two man tent. 
surrounded by villagers in a very remote village who had been drinking moonshine all night and we were like dang dude like hopefully everything goes cool like we were there working on a deforestation project um there's been scenarios where like we've been through so much together we're we're battle tested you know love that and that's um, amazing i mean we're talking 30 years of friendship and 15 years of business partnership yeah so like you know there's times in the early days where you know think times were hard you know we didn't know if the lights were going to stay on or not we didn't know if we were going to have to get a job but we know we just kept plugging away plugging away and when you go through war with with somebody yeah and you can count on them day in day out you show up at the office every day and they're there you know you go through the highs like you said the lows it just it just creates a really special partnership that is there's a lot of nonverbal communication if we're on set and something needs to happen, it's eye contact mm. and the thing gets done as opposed to like, you know, walkie talkies, you know what I mean? So yeah. it's like, it's cool. It, that's it's, amazing. It's that, that's amazing. awesome. That's a beautiful thing, you yeah. guys. And I bet there's a lot of things that you take from your own relationships with your romantic partners, with your marriages. Oh, our wives get jealous of our relationships. Yeah, they wish oh, we I'm had this sure. bond. Or they, like my wife wishes we had a bond like Roddy and I had. No, my <laughs> wife's like, can we go to Europe? She's, he's like, she's like, can you check with your other wife to make sure? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's forged through fire though, dude. It's like, it's, it's hard. Like he said, it's battle tested. It's from the from old Delhi, from the craziest bazaars and, and most extreme yeah. poverty to like the biggest, most glamorous perfume parties in Monaco that we've been to, you know, like it's just crazy, this crazy journey that we've been on That's all epic. because we picked up cameras one day. That's it's amazing. freaking wild to think about. That's amazing. Hey guys, I just want to remind you, if you want to find more content like this, you can visit SebastianNaum.com. That's Sebastian naum.com. You can also get a ton of other marketing resources from myself and my agencies, ranging from SEO to social media, influencer marketing, branding, web development, and more. Again, that's sebastiannaum.com. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the show. You guys have like a recent argument that you guys just got into and like how you guys solved it or a challenge that you, you got through together? I think the last argument, I don't even know when it was, but we got into a little fight and John walked out. He left the office. And then he called me like three minutes later. He's like, hey, look, dude, that's bullshit. <laughs> He's like, I'm coming back. <laughs> and he like came back, we like squashed it, and then it was over. So let's go grab a bite and squash this thing <laughs> stack. Because you know, you just learn. You're like, what's the point, dude? Like, yeah. it's not even in, in the grand scheme of things. It's meaningless. It's a small little frustration. We're in this for life, dude. That's why we do yoga, because we're yeah. going to do this until we're 180 years old. That's right. And uh, so let's go, let's go break some bread and just get to the bottom of it. Yeah. Love that. Love that. Grain, it's not, grain it's not, free bread. It's always about something else, right? <laughs> like, it's like you see the ripple, but the rock that makes the ripple is like four or five steps back. So it's like, what are we actually upset about here? Yeah. And then you get analogies, to the of it. John. Just full of analogies. I huh? think like also what it They're comes beautiful. down to is that we're on, we're on a <laughs> mission <laughs> here. We're on a mission. Right. Yeah. We're on a mission to transform this planet and make yeah. it as, you know, much better for future generations. Absolutely. Let's get you back know. to mission. Yeah. So it's like when you have, when you're mission focused, it's a lot easier to cut the noise mm. and just keep moving forward. And I'll tell you the best thing about a good partnership. Partnerships aren't easy, especially with people that you don't know super well. Sometimes there's like a financial partner that'll come in and you don't know that person, but it's a good deal. So you move forward. Partnerships are hard, but the best thing about a true partnership is that it's rare that both people are down at the same time. So if one person's down, the other person's carrying that person mm-hmm. and vice versa. And when you're both on, you're unstoppable. Yeah. And what you said there about the shared mission is, is that's so key. You've got yeah. the same true north. You've got the same mission. Ultimately, if you can find a way to always go back to mission, that's what's always going to you know, get you back up. So totally. and if you both have that same mission, it's like you can't, you know, one person is going to be down. Like you said, the other person is going to help you back up. So that's yeah. amazing. So yeah. going back to mission, uh, you got the poster up here of uh, Love and Bananas, which is, I saw it in, in theater at a special screening with you guys. I can't I remember what year that was, but. Um, 2018. Yeah. So it was epic film. Love the film. It's a beautiful story. Uh, share a little bit about that journey because it's, it's won a lot of awards. I mean, just yeah. tell us a little bit about this film. Totally. So the film is basically us taking viewers on an elephant rescue in uh, Thailand and Cambodia. And back to Roddy's point of like, we hear statistics, but we feel stories. Yeah. Like I could shake you and say, hey, Asian elephants are going extinct. They're predicted to be extinct by 2020. We have to do something. You're not going to no. feel it. I mean, you might, but what do you, no. you're not going to know what to do. 
But what if we transported you to the back of a moving truck flying down the superhighway in Thailand with an Asian elephant that's on the verge of a heat stroke about to collapse and kill us all? You know, and then you see this woman who's tiny and she's dedicated her entire life yeah. to rescuing elephants. So this is a story that maybe you'll go home and you'll tell your partner about or you'll tell your friend about. And that's, that's the power of story. And, and that's why this film is really like a proof of concept for us. Like we started this, pro, uh, this company to do original films, original productions that could like elevate the consciousness of the planet. Mm -hmm. Along the way, you have to keep the lights on. So we start our commercial company yep. and then you start the, you know, it starts rolling and it's going really well. And then you kind of like veer off course and then you're like, wait, Let's reset. And we're, mm. we're fortunate that a lot of our clients, we have the share, same shared intentions and, and same values. Uh, but this one, we were like, okay, pivot back. We got to make a movie. So what do we do? We just lo we, we had heard about this issue and we were, you know, like, what? Asian elephants are going extinct? Like, fuck that, dude. We got to do something about that. <laughs> Load cameras in the backpack and go. You know, and we partnered with Lex Shylert, who's, she's Multiple Mother Earth sanctuaries. personified. She's epic. And she just opened the doors for us. She let us stay on her elephant nature park and she took us on a rescue down to the border of Myanmar uh, where we met Noi Na, which is the elephant that we ultimately rescued. Yeah. And along the way, we just kind of educate viewers on what's going on with Asian elephants and, and introduce them to one. And through this one, they can understand what the broader context looks like. Yeah. And so we like to use it as a proof of concept because um, it drove impact, yeah. right? Like we've all seen a lot of documentaries that kind of leave you like, oh, fuck, what do I do now? Like, holy shit, that's gnarly. And then they're like, the end, bye, roll credits. This the, one we wanted to kind of put, put a way for people to, to get involved. Yeah, and th so that's what I wanted to ask you next, right? You watch, so for that documentary for me, like that was really special, it really hit me, right? Like it was, it was very powerful, it's an epic film. So Appreciate you watch, that. people, most people watch documentaries, you watch a film that really, makes you feel connected to the cause, right? It really hits the heartstrings. But I feel like maybe like 97% of people don't take any action, right, at all. Like, how, how do we change that? How do you actually inspire the action? How do you take it from the film, from the emotions and all that good stuff to actually doing something about it? Yeah, I think, I think the answer to the question is you just have to make it easy for them. Mm. You know, because most people just don't know where to start. And Tell you're them. so bombarded. Straight up. Do you're this. So, yeah, you're so overloaded with Frick, there's so much stuff out there. The second you open your Instagram or your social media, it's like, if you're not ice bathing for two minutes, you're gonna fucking die. Or if you're not doing this, like there's so much Content things overload. to think about. Yeah. You know, but if you can hook them and you get them engaged and they're watching past the first five seconds, which most people don't, mm -hmm. um, because we become very sophisticated as an audience, right? And our attention <laughs> is lower, but yep. I think we know that there's a lot of BS. So if I'm not in, I'm just gonna keep moving. Um, you just make it easy for them to get involved. And that's what we did with, with this movie. If you sat through the movie, we, you were in, we got mm -hmm. you. You took the huge journey from your head to your heart, mm -hmm. and now you're feeling something. If you watch that movie and then you go decide to ride an elephant, well, you're just a dick. <laughs> yeah. There's not much I can Straight do for up. that. Yeah. But I only heard of one, one story where that happened. And we really? did hear of it, yeah. Um, and the guy was a dick. And the guy was a dick. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, man. But no, we say here are some seriously or like super easy, tangible steps that you can do. We created an entire impact campaign. Um, we do believe that awareness is the first step. We don't know all the solutions. Talking, yeah. sharing will open this up to somebody who does know all the solutions. And that's really cool. And that's one of our new like kind of methods now with our yeah. C, C for B originals. Um, but in general, with, with Love and Bananas, we created an impact campaign that led to us rescuing eight elephants and breaking ground on a sanctuary in Laos in the name of the film. And we still continue to raise funds um, for Lek. She shows the film once a week at Elephant uh, Nature Park in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Really? And it's just been, the, the impact it's created and the lives that it's touched, like we still get emails to this day and it's, it's really cool. I mean, we had educational screenings at schools across the country, we partnered with like the San Francisco Film Society and did a school tour there. Yeah. Uh, but that happened all over the country. Nationwide. That's yeah, amazing. Nationwide. We sold it to Nat Geo in Asia, Nat Geo Latin America, sold it to places in Germany and Israel. Like it went worldwide. That's At Cathay so Pacific, sick. which is also really cool because people are flying to that part of the world and riding elephants is a big deal there. So mm. if you can show them that movie on a plane flying out, Huge, yeah. huge. That's gonna change behavior right away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I got to go and be at the park. I don't know if you remember, but I, I hit you guys up when I was in Chiang Mai, and you guys got me connected to go in there, 
to go um, to awesome. the sanctuary, and it was just a, it's I totally a powerful. About that. Did you meet Lek? Awesome. What's did that? Did you meet Lek? Yeah. No, I did not meet her. She's no, no, probably no. on a rescue or something. A- after this, actually, when we're, when we're having lunch, you got to remind me to tell you a story <laughs> about the day pri- <laughs> about the day prior. Yeah. 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 I would yeah. Love yeah. To hear Thailand's it. epic. Yeah. Uh, it was great. So, I'd love it, to go any back there. um, what is the what is the funniest shit that happened like behind the scenes in, that in Thailand? Yeah, because oh, I feel like that 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 had a, that had a an environment that could get for a lot of variables. Like shit could just go wrong, or you know, yeah. anything that comes intense, to mind, dude. It was pretty intense. Um, I mean, we're always having fun. We're always cracking jokes. We're in like we could be in the heaviest situations, and we're finding ways to make how it important funny, is that, you know? man? Like so how important. important? Laughter is our number one. It's absolutely critical, especially yeah. in a heavy documentary, finding if there's any moment of comic yeah. relief, you have to put it in. Yeah. Like there's a scene where the elephant farts. Yeah. Gotta throw it in. Gotta throw the party. You know, like how could you not throw a yeah. fart in? There's a scene where I get chased into a veterinary yeah. closet I by a that. raging, angry elephant that was mad that there was a, the <laughs> one that we rescued was there. That. So it's like a territorial thing. And she was just going wild. And so I had to split. And actually, it's a funny story. We used to say to the Q&As after the screenings all the time, basically what happened is this elephant's charging me and I have this big camera and I got to protect myself in the camera. I see a veterinary closet. So I jet towards the veterinary closet. And there's this like tourist park visitor that's frozen like a deer in the headlights. Now I try to dodge her. (laughs) But she's not moving and this elephant's charging us. So I accidentally shoulder check <laughs> this girl. <laughs> she goes flying into the <laughs> into the closet as well, thank goodness. And we both like go in and <gasps> to the back. Now this elephant's trunk comes into the closet, oh starts God. knocking over stuff, and is just like Jurassic Park, like trying to grab us and pull us out. No way. And it was scary dude, it, dude like, it's funny dude. now but it was scary yeah i bet like everybody's like dude. why weren't you recording that i'm like dude are you kidding me i was like literally like fear and panic to the top <sighs> oh it was my. like survival dude it was crazy are man fucking big man dude they're huge i got kicked by an elephant like just a, a little baby, baby elephant, elephant. <laughs> yeah the little baby elephant was running just went think like the really? tiniest little thing and i was like oh i thought my leg was gonna shatter damn it was insane no an elephant's <laughs> They're 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 beasts. They're big. Yeah, they'll, dude, they'll, they're dinosaurs. They're not, and you're not supposed to be near an elephant. What an experience, man! What yeah. an experience. Yeah, it was wild. I, I was mean, thinking about something you you said a little earlier, John, that I wanted to touch back on. It's you you started you know chase for balance for a reason with a mission, and then you have to keep the lights on too. So you start taking on different types of projects that are essentially just for profit only, or maybe right. they're not as mission driven as you like. Right. And it's, I think it's important to understand to the importance of keeping the lights on in order to keep that mission going, mm-hmm. right? So for example, even at our, at our marketing agency at Go Global, we have over 70% of our revenue comes from mission driven, purpose driven businesses, right? And there's some that, that, that don't, right? But to a certain extent, in order to continue the mission, in order to keep doing good, you have to have profits coming in in order to fund those missions, right? Um, sometimes it's it's tough to just make it all about the mission. So I think that balance, yeah. the purpose and profit balance is important, as long as that profit-only stuff isn't, you know, something that's causing harm, right? Um, but I think it's an important balance, so I can see how you guys have probably have to go back and forth sometimes between those projects, right? Yeah, totally. I mean, the balance is so key. We, we've had projects that we've passed on that were big budgets that would have been pretty transformative for us at mm. the time, um, but they didn't fit in line with our yeah. greater values. And so we pass and we can stand in our integrity with that. Yeah. And we're lucky at the point now, like people kind of know what we stand for. Yeah. They know why you come to change for balance. And I mean, I think 100% of our clients are in, our, in the purpose and mission driven and we can get behind them. Love that. And so with, when, since we've expanded to be marketing and PR, we're not just video anymore. Video is a really important tool, but we do their full strategy, their full communication, marketing, public relations, so that we can help them grow. And then we're with them as they grow. And that's that. really awesome. That's great. That's awesome. So when I think of you know, mission-driven video content and this and that, and then I, I, you know, I see a lot of the, the UFC, the fight stuff. You guys did a lot of shit for Ruka, which is epic and looks like a lot of fun. And honestly, this is something I've actually never asked you guys. So, but I know you guys love that stuff, right? So 
I'm having a I'm having a tough time tying mission driven and positive change with you know with fighting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So where does that come in? Because I'm sure there's something there going on, especially totally. the, to, with the stories behind the people, yeah. right? Yeah. Hundred percent. So our pr primary work right now in the fighting space is with uh, incredible athlete and human named Marlon Cheeto Vera. Okay. He's a good friend of ours. And although it is a story about a fighter, it's also a much bigger story. We're talking about a guy who came from a farm town in Ecuador with not a lot to his name and his family's name. And you know, throughout these different years and hardships of his life, he had a daughter that was born with a rare condition called Mobius syndrome, which is some sort of facial paralysis where mm. she wasn't able to smile. He knew wow. that in his current situation in Ecuador, he was never gonna be able to pay the 80K required to get her surgery. Okay, and he knew that the only way that he was going to pull this off was to get into the UFC and win fights so that he could do that. So this is a story about somebody who was born with, you know, not every, every advantage and opportunity, but to said, you know what, I'm going to fight for what I believe in. I'm going to fight for my family mm. and I'm going to fight my way to a world championship and get my hand raised to raise that other kid in that other farm town who was born in the same circumstance, mm. right? So this is really a story beyond fighting, right. but fighting is like a metaphor for life, really. Yeah. You know, like a good friend of ours, Jason Perillo, who's actually his head coach, always says that, you know, in fighting, you gotta want it. And a coach can't want it for you, a mentor can't want it for you, a business coach can't want it for you, your wife can't want it for you, your partner can't want it for you. If you don't want it, you're never gonna get it. Mm -hmm. And what does want it mean? It doesn't just mean sitting on the couch and manifesting. It means knowing what you want, being really clear on that, pulsing that out to the universe, but then taking every step mm -hmm. you need to get what you want. And putting in the work, putting in the blood, putting in the sweat and tears, and overcoming all the obstacles to get what you want, because yeah. that's all that exists in your reality. If you want to be a champion in the UFC, you have to be obsessed. Mm. There's no room for you know, one foot in, one foot out. One foot out gets you knocked out, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's a different world. That's a, good that's a different world. You really have to be obsessed. Yeah, you have yeah. to. It's the only yeah. way. And for us, I mean, we we're multifaceted. We love yeah. elevating the consciousness, but we also love working out, and we love training, and we love stories. And when it comes to fighting, there's no game with higher stakes, and the high stakes are the key of a good story. And you, everybody fights for a reason. You don't just wake up and say, "I want to go get punched in the face today." Yeah. So you meet some of the most interesting characters, leading really interesting lives. And Cheeto, like he said, is, is the heart of our, like, of what we're doing in the MMA world right now. And he's fighting for his daughter. He's fighting for his family. And that's a story I think we can all get behind. Yeah, that's inspirational. That's yeah. epic. I love what you said, Rod, about, you know, there's so much talk about manifestation nowadays, right? Because it's becoming more and more mainstream to talk about these things in terms of manifesting what you're putting out and what you get back in and, and kind of get into the, the quantum field, into the universe mm -hmm. and how that works and how you receive things. And, there's a lot, I think a lot of people do think, oh, I could just sit on the couch and fucking manifest, you know? Yeah. But, and there's a certain aspect of doing that part of it, you know, of manifesting and putting it out to receive, but then you gotta go out and get it. Once mm -hmm. something is a full fuck yes, once you feel something, yeah. then you do have to go out there and, yeah. and get it and get after it, you know? And work, totally. Work tirelessly. We, um, do you know who Neville Goddard is? I don't. Okay, so you would love this guy. He's one of the original American mystics in the early, like, mid 1900s. And one of the things he says is, assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled and continue therein, and the mm -hmm. universe has no choice but to harden that assumption into fact. So deny like, all senses. Deny anything in the physical world that says otherwise, mm. and your assumption must be hardened into fact. I love that. And so like, that's a part of it, right? Yeah. Like you have to feel, you have to live from the end. What is your biggest dream, goal, and desire? Yeah. And can you live from that space? That's a part of it. The other part is getting up and doing the work. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's powerful. Uh, you know what I find fascinating about this is that a lot of this stuff has been said since like biblical times. Yeah. You totally. know? It's 100%. just in different ways. Yeah. In different ways. And now, you know, Joe Dispenza is huge right now yeah. in that field. But I was just telling you guys before the recording about this book that I just finished from Jose Silva on mind control. And like a lot of these things are the same thing uh, about feeling that and, and yeah. you know, working backwards mm -hmm. at it, you know? Yeah, totally. And uh, I think it's like, for me, I can achieve that feeling pretty easily in meditation. 
after I'm like 15 to 20 minutes into my meditation that like 20th through 35th or 40th minute, I'm, I'm in that zone and I'm feeling it and I'm, I feel my body vibrating and it's powerful and it's amazing. And then the challenge is, and the meditation's over and then you're out living the rest of your day. Like, getting back into that feeling, getting mm-hmm. back into this sort of feeling of, of the gratitude of feeling what you're trying to manifest and what you're looking to achieve um, when, you know, when you're driving your car and somebody cuts you off or something like that <laughs> and then you just get thrown off and you've completely forgotten about it. So mm-hmm. how can you live in that moment of constant you know, gratitude of the feeling of this sort of high buzzing you know, energy that you're attracting? You know? Well, that's well, interesting. Like, we're all programmed, right? Like we, we are like a computer. Right, our parents program us, our teachers program us, society programs us, and so like we are a computer at the end of the day. Now, if we were raised and our parents taught us, look, parents are our parents for the first time. It's not like they have ten, ten, you know, past examples of experience right. that they're that they're working off of. Their parents for the first time, they're doing their best. A lot of them, our parents were immigrants, right? Mm-hmm. They're navigating a new country, a new language. So like, if our parents raised us to say, live from the end. What do you want to create? And that was your awareness from day one, it would be a lot easier. But we're reprogramming ourselves to believe that at 30, 35, 40, 45. Mm-hmm. So it takes repetition. Yeah. And then we got to pull the weeds of the old things that aren't serving us, right? So if we have poverty programs, if we have lack of love or worthiness programs, if we yeah. have um, any of these programs that are holding us back, then yeah we can sit there and manifest and visualize all day long but if our subconscious is operating correct. from that place we're not going to get anywhere correct and then if we're surrounded by people who are holding us back and not propelling us forward in the vi- direction of our dreams we're not going to get there absolutely so there's so many different things that we got to curate our lives to be able to to support that vision well, one of the reasons i actually right find there. that it is actually quite challenging is because personally I've been raised with a ton of love. I'm very lucky and I'm very grateful and fortunate that the parents that I have, and I think about these things and I'm like, man, even me with the upbringing that I had, is, life is still hard. Right. <laughs> and it's yeah. still hard to sort of change totally. these subconscious, you know, <laughs> lack mentality things yeah. and like not enoughness type stuff. And I'm like, damn, I was raised with all the fucking love in the world. Yeah. And I still have those things ingrained in me. Like how, the, you know, totally. it's like wild. And it's like, I can only imagine people that are raised in totally different environments. Yeah where they're not even given that love. It's totally. like, damn, like, I get it. It's, yeah. it's hard. <laughs> it's, it's hard. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, um, so Change for Balance has been working with Charlize Theron um, in Africa for the prevention of HIV for a long time now. You guys have been working on this stuff. Um, share a little bit about this project. Yeah. You want to take it away? Or? Sure. So we've been working in South Africa with CTAOP for about 10 years now. And that yeah. stands for? Charlize Theron Africa Outreach Project. And they're not reinventing the wheel. They're not coming to be the saviors down there. What they're doing is finding local organizations who are really helping their communities in different ways. HIV prevention, testing, education. You know, for example, one of their programs used to use co-ed sports to bring guys and girls on the same team Mm -hmm. to teach them how to work together, right? To teach, treat each other as equals, right? Um, So that they could have respect, so that boys could have respect for young girls. Right? But through this process, there's HIV awareness, education, um, testing, treatment. Right? So in a world where there's a lot of stigma, like if you have a small corner store in your neighborhood and you can't go buy condoms because the guy who works there is your dad's friend and he's going to tell your dad that you bought condoms mm. and now all of a sudden everybody's going to be talking about it in your small community. So they have these different programs, these youth groups that will educate, give uh, condoms, do different things to, to help um, educate these kids to prevent HIV. I mean, it's young girls there are at, at risk more, way more so than boys. Do you, can you, I know we said st- stories are more important, but do you have some stats on hand? Yeah, I mean, you're dealing with a country that's just, it's 1% of the global population, but it has nearly a quarter of all HIV. Wow. So, it's pretty wild how they got, you know, just ravaged. And Charlize grew up in South Africa, so she saw the epidemic firsthand. Mm. Today, young girls are almost five times more likely to get HIV than young boys. 
So there's mm -hmm. a huge gender inequality, which is why the program that Roddy was talking about, the soccer, can be so beneficial. But whether it's soccer, or whether it's drama, or whether it's arts and crafts, they do a lot of things. And they just recognize that young people <laughs> are, have always been, and always will be the drivers of social change. Mm -hmm. So they empower young people to be the leaders, to be the best leaders. And like his point, they're not trying to be the savior. Like we know how to get it done. They're like, you know how to get it done. Yeah. We're just gonna help facilitate. We're gonna help fundraise. We're gonna help empower you, give you the tools that you need to succeed. And so we've gone down there, I think four times with Charlize and the team. Um, and it's just been incredible to see what they do firsthand. South Africa is a, an incredible country. The culture is so beautiful. We still haven't surfed, which is something we need to do. Guys, the, the challenge of making mission-driven film and documentaries, I think one of the biggest challenges there is that the money isn't as readily available as it is for other types of content, although maybe things are changing. But is there something for creators um, that are looking to get in this field that, that you would say to them? As far as are things changing in terms of is there more money in mission-driven content, I'd probably say no. I think we're getting closer. We're getting closer. Yeah, I mean, so in when general, we no. started, yeah. consciousness was not even a term you could say without being looked at as though you were some insane hippie. That even just sustainability. Like, yeah, even sus word. even organic. Like, yeah, yeah. It was crazy. That's we, wild. Yeah, yeah, and now it's... And by the way, and it's still like that in a lot of the world and in a lot of the country. We're just like in this bubble. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's true. I mean, like, I think this film is a proof of concept that um, you can have a meaningful film that that can do well. Um, there are a lot of documentaries that are like doing, doing great. I think we still have ways, a little ways to go. What I would say to somebody that's trying to like get in and wants to do mission driven work, start working with some organizations or some small nonprofits because they have embedded in them incredible stories. And they're often walking the tightrope of like budget and big dreams and goals because they yeah. need to finance the, or they need to fundraise, but they typically don't have the money for big productions. But if you're a young filmmaker, get in there and make some incredible yeah. human centered emotional stories. And then just watch the impact that that can do if you have like a little bit of a marketing strategy to get that in front of people. Yeah. Is this tough? Is it tough though to stay motivated if that kind of keeps going for a long time of like, I can barely make it because I'm in this field? and I'm trying to do good for the world. So that it creates this association that doing good is suffering and sacrifice, you know what I mean? So like, there's this aspect of, even with my content, even with this podcast, or just the concept of conscious capitalism in general, it's, it's trying to show people that you can do good and still make money and still make a yeah. great living and live a good life because we have this ingrained concept that doing good means sacrifice and suffering. Yeah. You know, but and I think it's, we need to change that. With the state of the world, the innovation in this space is really going to be what helps us live a prosperous life for many years to come. So the key, I think, is innovation. If you're going to do something, you need to innovate, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you mm -hmm. can innovate in this space, if you can add value to the world, then you're going to get paid for it. Right. You know, if you can capture attention, add value, people are going to come pay you for that. So it's like, yeah, if your stuff is mediocre and you think that you're just going to start, you're going to create a documentary for like some organization and like, don't be naive, you know, you're going to have to hustle. Yeah. You're going to have to work hard. It's still business. Yeah, it's a business. And at the end of the day, it's like, are you willing to put in the time and hustle? Like, yeah, for a long time, a lot of our projects were not mission driven. We've been doing this for 15 years, you know, five to seven days a week. So it's like, you know, after years and years and years, we finally were able to focus on what we want to do. But for many of those years, we were taking any job we could yeah. get as long as it wasn't in conflict with our values. Yeah. Correct. So That's that we, we can keep yeah. the lights on. Yeah. You and know? today, consumers yeah. want to make smart choices. They want to do the right yeah. thing. Yeah. It goes back to making it easy for them. <clears throat> Absolutely. Absolutely. Boys, uh, you created the most viral video on climate change with Prince EA, which is amazing. Uh, this was called Dear, Dear Future Generation so Sorry. And um, he gives a specific call to action at the end with certain with an organization that you can get involved in. Um, and then more recent one, there's one called uh, Dear Parents, Do You Love Your Kids? Uh, you guys also did that with Prince EA, which, which I thought it was, was epic. And it, he ends with this line, which is so powerful. Uh, you did not inherit this earth from your, 
excuse me, you did not inherit this earth from your ancestors, you're borrowing it from your children. It's a, just such an epic line. So he basically leaves you with this line, you feel all this emotion and sense of responsibility. Um, and then again, he cuts at the end, it's like the video ends, and then there's like an extra minute or minute and a half with this call to action of what you can do. And it's a little bit of what we were talking about earlier is, okay, you've kind of created this sort of connection from your brain to your heart, you're there, and now you're ready to take action. How important do you guys think that this type of content, this sort of like four to five minutes, so it's not super short form where it's like a minute, but it's four to five minute content within the specific call to action at the end. How, how important do you think that call to action is at the end for people to take action? I think it's important. I think if there isn't a way for people to get involved afterwards, they're just left inspired and possibly even afraid. You know, because you bring all these things to light. You talk, oh, I'm inheriting it from my children. Oh, my God. Like, yeah. what world are they going to live in? What can I do? So having that call to action at the end, I think, is super important. It's also important that it comes from, like, Prince EA's fans. Like, that campaign was targeted towards the people who love Prince EA because they're into the environment. They're into creating positive change. So if you hear it from, like, a trusted voice and somebody you actually love listening to, yeah. it's easier to integrate into your life as opposed to, like, not creating an inspiring piece and just saying, hey, we should be doing this, 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 and this. Like, so e anytime you tell somebody to do something, they're going to push back a little bit, even if they're into it, even if they're excited mm. about it. But it's like you try to use these different strategies, create something artistic and fun and, and entertaining, you know, like we always talk about like education through entertainment, you know, like don't just try to educate people, entertain them first and then slide in the education. So why like, do you think that there's a, there's a push back? Is it just the immediate pushback of like, I don't, nobody likes to be told what to do. Is that or kind like, of the bottom line? or like, you know, you're selling me on something. Yeah. Like at the end of the day for that one in particular, we were like working on donations and this, we're yeah. asking people to open their wallets in the middle of like towards the end of a pandemic where they've been dealing with financial hardships and stuff like that. You know, they haven't been able to work, maybe their business closed down, all these different things. Yeah, it's so tough. it's like, nobody, nobody wants, at the end of the day, people who aren't like set up financially, anytime you ask them to do something with their money, it's like, they're gonna pull back. So like, yeah. the, the art is getting people to contribute to things that they care about and, and doing it in a way that's gonna add value to their lives and the planet, right? If so, if, if what they're doing is real, if what if what you're participating in is real and is actually, you know, has a track record and an integrity and a reputation, all of those things make it easier. I mean, for us to believe, we have to believe in it, and those things have to be present for us to believe. And the viewer has to feel like they're making that decision on their own. It's yeah. like they got a little bit of a push, but it's really their decision that yeah. they decided on. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a little nod to our sponsors as well. Like. The Nature Conservancy, which is an organization who was awesome to partner with on Dear Parents, they financed the production. Mm -hmm. So at the end, we kind of give a little plug to them, tell people how to get involved and go to the natureconservancy.org to yeah. learn more. Yeah. Or yeah. nature.org. I love that. Which yeah. would be so different if I'm just seeing an ad or like, like those old school nonprofit ads that you see on TV or something like that, where it just goes straight into like, donate for this reason it's yeah. such a different way to tell the story yeah you know totally and yeah. it was like dear pair uh, dear future generations we were raising money for like deforestation efforts mm -hmm. in, Af in africa and all over the world and um th like that did pretty well yeah you know it, was it great. raised quite a bit of money and that's awesome yeah so guys you now have a new format that you're coming out with that i've been seeing on instagram so you've got sort of these max 90 second type things mostly real uh, real types um or TikToks, right so this is a, a new way of raising awareness to a cause by very very short form storytelling uh, recently you guys have been doing some stuff on lithium batteries so you see Rod rolling around a Tesla, which is actually your Tesla, but I believe, Rod, you also have an electric uh, car, yeah, an electric yeah. Audi. Yeah. And I have more devices than I can think of, right? Like, it is, what is, how realistic is the whole thing with lithium batteries? Like, we're so dependent on this, on, on this you know, thing. And ha how can we actually, you know, change? How can this change at all? Because we're going into more and more lithium battery usage. Totally. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, change for balance, we're calling them change for balance originals. 
And really what happened after Love and Bananas is we got the opportunity to create more long form content, to pitch more ideas, pitch more movies. Like, oh, what else are you guys making? And we kind of fell into the rhythm of like, okay, let's pitch a documentary series or a feature length documentary. The reality is those take a long time. Yeah. And you can even be developing them for years before the, you just get the final no that puts the death nail in the project. Mm. Getting no's is part of the process. That's fine, you know? Like, and dealing with that, rolling on, refining your pitch and learning to do more is great. But we got to a certain point where like, we're kind of done waiting, you know? Like we don't wanna just, and not everything has to be a feature length documentary. We had these Google Docs and vision boards for documentaries that we wanted to make that are just overflowing with ideas. Yeah. So how can we just put them out in a short format way? We're already doing them for some of our clients and friends that are like, you know, influencers or big in the, on the social space. Why don't we just start doing some for ourselves. With social causes. Totally. Yeah. So, you know, we believe in a couple of things. You're either reacting to the world you don't want or actively creating the world you do mm -hmm. want. We could sit here and be like, oh, we just got to develop more. Why don't they just buy it? Or we could just actively create a world where we're putting out the content that we want. Yes. Putting forth the stories that we want and see if we can actively create change through this short form content, which is kind of, again, the, like a really big popular thing of our times. We see those videos all the time. So yeah. we're like, why not we make them? Uh, when it comes to cobalt and lithium, like our first two were definitely on on like the sort of green revolution and sort of the dark side of that. Yeah. Because that's something that really interests us. You know, when when popular conventional thinking is all leading towards one thing, we're like, well, what's behind the hood of that? Mm. Or what's like behind yeah. you know, the scenes. Um, when we learned about cobalt, it was pretty eye opening, you know, and I don't really know what we can do about that. I mean, clean cobalt is one way. Being aware of it, this is one of those situations where we don't have all the answers, but maybe we can put forth the question and together we can crowdsource a solution. Yeah. And that might be really cool. Because you can't let perfection get in the way of progress. We're not perfect. None of us are perfect. I still drive my electric car. I still use my iPhone. I'm reliant on, my com on our cameras and on our computers yeah. to feed my kid. So. How can we be smarter? Is there a way that we can raise the standards for what's going on in the cobalt, cobalt mines in Africa yeah. to at least give them a living wage or something? Let's talk about it. Let's find the solution. But what's happening is not good. And you can't call it a green revolution when it's built on the backs of child labor. It's just it's it's not going to happen. And so it's one of those things that's like elephants for us. Like elephants are dying. Well, let's go do something about it. Yeah. This, this was another one of those things. Let's go do something about it. And they're not all going to be heavy. You know, not all these, yeah. all these shorts are going to be heavy um like, and, like documentaries and long form film still have a lane but we're seeing a lot of available attention on instagram and tiktok and twitter and these different short form platforms right so it's like or like youtube shorts so it's like that's an avenue mm -hmm. that's an avenue to create change there's people waiting to see and learn and educate yeah. themselves on those platforms and if we can plant seeds of awareness there, that's exciting for us because we can turn, turn them <laughs> around quick. You know, like John said, we've been working on some documentaries for over three years and then yeah. we get a, the nail in the coffin and it's a no. So again, John talked a little bit about cobalt, but when it comes to lithium, like, you know, in California, we talk about having all electric vehicles being sold by 2030. Right. Okay, last summer we had a heat wave and Gavin Newsom asked, asked us to stop charging our electric cars. Okay, we have a really old grid and there's no way that you can put superchargers on every corner because it'll fry the grid. Mm. Okay, so there's hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of change that needs to happen with our electric grid before we can even sustain electric vehicles full 100% adoption. We have a 2% adoption rate on electric vehicles across the country and Gavin Newsom's, Newsom is asking us to stop charging our cars in the middle of a heat wave. Mm. Okay, how is the world going to work? Right, so, and let's get real, where does lithium come from? How many fossil fuels are used to mine lithium, okay? We're not having the exhaust come out of our tailpipe, but it's coming out of the coal mine. Where is the charge of your battery coming from? And people need to think about all these things, right? So the answer isn't stop driving electric cars, go get yourself a diesel, go get a V10 and just start polluting the earth. But the answer is educate yourself and don't be naive and start flying this flag that I have an electric car, so I'm a part of the change. You're not. We both have electric cars. You know, like we both got conned. <laughs> <laughs> but we did it because we want to create change. We want to yeah. be part of the change, right? So we're like, okay, 
I want to be a part of the change. They're telling me to get an electric car. I'm going to get one. We yeah. lift the hood and it's not perfect. And we don't want to say, hey, let's pull the plug on this, but we need innovation. Yeah. You know, we need clean and it's still energy. A young industry. So we're just thinking, all right, let's bring awareness to it and let's make it better. Let's There's still the lesser of the evils at a certain point you have to make a decision, right? Yeah, there is. But if all of our vehicle, power is coming right? from coal, then it's not clean. The EV is not clean because it's coming from yeah. a fossil fuel. Lithium is a finite resource. It comes from the earth, right? Cobalt comes from the earth. And there's a lot of other minerals and batteries that come from the earth. So we're still using plant and, and you know, earth resources to get around town. So it's not like we're just like, we're just jumping from one source of fuel <laughs> to another. This, you know? is the, this is the kind of thing that can also be frustrating too, right? In terms of like, fuck, you just educated me on this this subject on via short form content and it's like there's no solution to this right it's not like you know I watched this documentary on elephants and there's this beautiful call to action that I can take action on and help this cause with this like you said this is just right now it's maybe it's just raising awareness and being like you know starting to get people to question the industry right. so that we can figure out ways that we can improve this and look, I think right? that's really important I think being transparent that and some of them some we do have a solution, you know, that yeah. we we'll come out with, but some we don't, and that's okay because maybe somebody out there will. Yeah. And awareness is the tool. Right. Awareness is the first step. And somebody commented like uh, on one of the posts, "Hey, this is a new industry. Like, you got to give them like the benefit of the doubt. They're working. A billion dollar industry does not get the benefit of the doubt. And they, just because it's new doesn't necessarily give it the right to pollute the earth. How much? Yeah, it's like how much of the budget is going into the solution yeah. of what you know. The it's a corporation. It's Their job yeah. is to make money. Their job isn't to create sustainable solutions. And if the consumers say, "Hey, you know what? Like for H and M, there's a reason why H and M is going more sustainable. It's because their consumers yeah. demand it. Yeah. Right. All these because these of all fashion the brands. Yeah. Right. So like if a billion people are saying, hey, I want my lithium and I want my cobalt and I want my minerals for my batteries to be right. humanely sourced. I want these people in Africa to have decent living wages and I don't want kids in the mines. Yeah. Then those producers of those ele- of those, uh, m- you know, resources are going to change their practices because they know that that if Chevy starts doing that and people start buying Chevy, they want to get part of that market share back, right? So it's like we create the demand, so we have to demand the right things in order for them to act accordingly. Yeah, and that's why conscious capitalism stems from conscious consumerism. Exactly. You know, and so it, the more we can educate and inspire people to be conscious consumers, that's just going to force businesses to yeah. go into conscious practices, yeah. right? So totally. that's really that's, that's yeah. it, man. Yeah, I love that. Like one thing that I think is really worth mentioning with John and and my philosophy as far as like creating changes is we, like Desmond Tutu said, if you want to create change, you don't talk to your friends, you talk to your enemies, hmm. right? And we're living in a world of echo chambers where people's hearts are in the right place, but their actions are not. They're talking to people who agree with them because that's comfortable. And anybody who's achieved yeah. anything in life knows that excellence and, and championship, the championship mindset is, lives in discomfort. Right. So like, you know, why do we go in an ice bath? It's because it's, it's uncomfortable, but there's a lot of benefits. You know, why do we work hard? Why do we train our bodies to like failure? Because there's a lot of benefits. Why do we eat clean? It sucks. There's a lot of benefits. Right. So like if we want to create change on this planet, we have to rest in discomfort. Mm. We have to challenge the people in a loving, kind way that we disagree with on everything. So like the Republicans hate the Democrats, right? There's all these race uh, situations going on where people don't like this race and don't like that race. And there's like abortion and this and that. The yelling at each other and agreeing with our friends is not going to create change. And if we're going to create a sustainable future and environment for us to all thrive forward, we have to learn to unite and come together and bring both sides together to say, we agree on these things and we disagree on these things, yeah. but we're in this leaky canoe together, we're either gonna sink or swim. We're gonna survive, mm-hmm. or we're gonna burn this place down and wipe out a majority of the animals on our way out, mm-hmm. right? And, and the planet's gonna survive, but human beings might not, mm. right? So it's like, it's not about save the earth, <laughs> it's about save humans, mm. you know? And, and yeah. the only way to do that is to extend your hand. Democrats, yeah. extend your hand to Republicans. Republicans, extend your hand to Democrats. I look at them in the eye and say, I love you, 
and we're going to make it. We're going to work together to make this planet heaven on earth. You know what I mean? And that's, that's how we live our life and that's how the, the lens that we take with every project that we work on. Yeah, and yeah. the beautiful thing about that is that if you get into that discomfort enough, if you get uncomfortable enough, you end up getting comfortable with yeah. the discomfort. Totally. totally. You know? that's and that's the only about. way to do it. Yeah, I think, yeah. And this is, I'm going to butcher this quote, but in the 1600s, I don't even know. We're going to cut this. But I think Cicero said most of mankind's <laughs> problems come from their inability to sit in stillness. Hmm. But sitting in stillness with each other and somebody that you disagree with is just the next level of that. And that's going to be a, an insane video we're going to put out during election season. You heard it here. Oh, first. nice. Yeah, just nice. wait for that. I love that. We'll keep you on your toes. The other thing I would mention for what Roddy was saying is that all these things can feel extremely daunting. Like I'm not doing enough of this or wait, <clears throat> I, like there's, you're getting bombarded with things. Like, oh, is there seed oil in my lunch? Am I doing the ice bath? Am I doing all these <laughs> things? You know, like it can feel so yeah. daunting. There's kids in Africa. There's, it's like, it's, it's so hard. Much. There's so much. so much. And I'm reminded, I think if we coax Roddy, maybe he'll tell this story, but it's, it's the starfish story. Do you want to tell a story? I can tell a story. <laughs> So David Castleman, who is an executive producer of Love and Bananas, would tell the story at every, every post-screening Q&A. And the story goes like this. There's a boy on the coast, and there's a, it's low tide, and there's a bunch of starfish that have wiped up, washed up on the shore. And the boy is going, thousands of starfish are on the shore, and they're dying. And he's grabbing the starfish and throwing them back in the ocean. And this old man walks by and says, hey, son, what are you doing? And he says, I'm saving starfish. And the guy says, look at up and down the beach. There's thousands of starfish. You're not going to save them all. And he picks one up and throws it in the ocean. And he says, I saved that one. You know, so the idea is that perfection is not the enemy of progress. You can't let that be, you know, so you might not be able to save them all, but you can save that one. Mm -hmm. And so when things feel daunting and there's so many issues and there's so much that you feel like you need to do. Yeah. One little step. That's it. Yeah. You know, that's it. And to take that a step further, because I think that this is something for me when I started getting into this world, into this movement, when I joined Conscious Capitalism, the board of it, one of the things was this sort of individual action that you can take can be very minor, right? But that can inspire uh, a scaled form of it. So that can, that can inspire a scaled form of, of good, right? So perhaps a businessman could come in and see the boy that's tossing the single starfish and come up with a, a business plan that can help save all of the starfish and scale that good, right? And so that, that's a little bit of, a, of what I'm after is how can we scale good? Because, because business and because capitalism essentially is, is, is made of that is how do we scale? How do we more? Okay, well, but why don't we just scale good? right through that process right yeah it's so true yeah. I mean, what is a logging company what are they based on they're based on the price of a fallen tree well how can we create the price of a standing tree mm. it's that how Absolutely. can we scale that yeah yeah well b before we cut out here guys there's one other thing that i wanted to ask you about because glyphosate is something that i that i find fascinating and it's just like in america we somehow we literally created laws that made it okay to spray to spray glyphosate and poison our own people like what the fuck like how did that happen and it's been happening for so long and finally there's some awareness and finally we're starting to see some change and some laws and this this and that is there is there light at the end of the tunnel with this is this something you guys are going to be creating some content about because i feel like it is yeah yeah as, as far as light at the end of the tunnel, I think, I think so. I think awareness is, is the key. I mean, Germany has, has banned it. It's no longer going to be used at the end of 2024. Austria banned it. Italy banned it years ago. There's cities and states that have banned glyphosate. Yeah. It's an issue we're insanely passionate about. As far as solving the issue at large, it's, it's one of many other issues that I think we need to bring Chris Rock's idea into life where politicians have to wear on their jackets like NASCAR jackets who their sponsors are. Mm. And I bet you'll see like a lot that. of Monsanto and Bayer patches on those politicians. Oh, man. And if you want to really go deep, you know, the food and drug and chemical spraying of pesticides and the medicines sold 
in the hospitals are very tied together. Okay, so like if you want to go deep on it, it's like people are getting sick because of the practices that are passed and then they're being sold the same medicines and billions and trillions of dollars of profits are being made. So this is a money game at the end of the day. It's all about money. And so the reality is if people stand up and say, I don't want to eat that shit and I'm not going to buy it. And if you don't buy it, nobody's going to make it. Yep. Okay. And it. we hold the control in our hands. Now, yeah. now, we can't be naive. There's a lot of people in this world who don't have those kind of options. Yeah. Because there's food deserts everywhere. Yep. Okay. There's people who are have not in the best financial position who have three kids who are working two jobs and a single mother who is just trying to put food on the table. They don't have the option to go eat organic. Yep. And those are the exact targets of these practices. Yep. Yeah. It sucks. But, you know, hopefully together we can create awareness for this and put solutions in place to take care of that mama because she can't do it alone. And I mean, like I've had these arguments and I've had people call me out on it and say, hey, you don't know about food deserts. I, I do know about food deserts. But at the end of the day, we need to command change through our financial practices. We vote with our dollars as best we can. You know? <coughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, it is, it can be easier said than done for people like us who have those options. You know, one thing I was, uh, I was in Turkey and uh, I was, uh, I was having a drink with the, with a Turkish girl and um, it was funny. So she's, she's just like, just puffing her dirt, you know, smoking her cigarette hard, you know, and she's kind of like making like fun of how Californians and people from LA, like we're so clean and you know, it was just, it was just funny. And, and she brings up uh, air one and I was like, that's so weird. Like, you know what Air One is? And like, there's only like seven of them, I think. And they're all in California, I think. And um, so basically she was like, yeah, like there's all these like TikToks and all kinds of stuff and content around making fun of basically, you know, LA, Southern California type people and about how much we care about organic and this and that. So the point that I'm trying to make with that is that as humans who are in this in this sort of bubble in this world it's easier to make those decisions right and it's it's almost like it's almost like not cool if you don't make those decisions right but i think it's also our responsibility to then to introduce these things and give awareness to our family and cousins or friends that are in different states and different countries and inspire that and, and inspire the change through the education and sharing that type of content so sharing this sort of purpose-driven, mission-driven content around these causes that we care with people that are outside of our circles. Like you said, you have to reach and shake the hand of the people that are on the opposite end in order to truly inspire the change with the people that, are, that it makes you uncomfortable with in order to inspire that change, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Brilliantly put. Yeah, I yeah. mean, if you know, then you kind of have an imp a duty to act. Absolutely. Yeah, you Absolutely. have to. And, and when it comes to those food deserts, we've, we did a project that we were in talks with, like I think it was the Inglewood Social Justice League or something, and they drove us around Inglewood and they were showing us basically what it looked like in the food deserts, but they also showed us the community gardens that they were building, that they were mm. planting. It's not a perfect solution by any means because there's a lot of people you have to feed, there's a lot of poverty, yeah. but, and we don't have all the answers. This is another one of those situations, but together we know that we can come up with it. So let's have the conversations, let's yeah. get dirty, let's put out content that talks about it and let's see what can happen. Absolutely. And this is actually a really important thing. So we work really closely with Dr. Alejandro Younger and he's an incredible, you know, you can look him up at Dr. Alejandro Younger, incredible information about the gut, you know, detoxification. He's mm -hmm. the godfather of detox. We are surrounded by toxins. Okay, the stuff that we use to wash our hands, wash our clothes, wash our countertops, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat is jam packed with toxins. We talked about all the different systems of the body. We never talk about detoxification, right? So he says, if you go to a grocery store, you should only shop on the outside of the grocery store because that's where all the real food is. You got the meat and fish, you got the veggies, you got the fruit, and you got the you know various other things that they have along mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. the beer and wine no <laughs> but I'm so like, beer and wine's on the inside we're moving it to the outside just for this now. like he says if you want to be healthy eat real food and do not eat food like products in the center of the grocery stores and in these food deserts it's all food like products jam packed with preservatives jam packed with different types of of pesticides on the different wheat and corn and soy that's grown Right, so like, if you have the means, eat yeah. real food. 
And that's a great step in not getting sick and not having to go get medicine and not continually supporting companies like Bayer, who not only make the pesticides, but also make the medicine to fix you. Mm. Yeah. So it's like, we hold the power. You can make the decision to be healthy and to live a life on your terms, or you can continue to eat bullshit and get sick and perpetuate yeah. that cycle. Well, I love what you guys are doing. I'm so proud of you guys. You're, you know, you're conscious creators. That's what you're doing and bringing to the world. So I want to leave you on, uh, I want to ask you a question. What are two traits that you believe a conscious leader because to be a conscious creator, you have to be a conscious leader, whether you're leading lots of other people or you're leading your own life and you're leading your company. So what are two traits that you find that a conscious leader must embody in today's world? I'll ask each of you the same. Should we each say Please. one? Please, you go ahead, you go first. Courage is the first mm. thing that comes to mind. And the root of that core is, it means heart. Mm. I, I think courage. Um, and there's a lot of things that fall under that, but that just, that willingness to take the first step to, I mean, again, when we were saying sustainable in consciousness, people were laughing at us. Uh, it took a little bit of courage to just stand up and be like, no, this is what we stand for. Yeah. This is what we're gonna do. And, but under that is, is the love that we have for our planet, for our friends, and for our family. And I think that's what sometimes could get lost. If you tell people like, go green, don't eat that, they think you're judging them, but really, no, I love you. I don't want you to put that inside of you. Uh, and it just, it's just, yeah. it's everything. We love animals. That's why we stand up for animals. We love this world. We love living. And that's why we do what we do. I love that. And you know what's awesome though too, John, is that like the world is changing so much that these things that would get you made fun of back then, they're cool as shit now. Yeah, <laughs> totally. You know what I mean? And like this multifaceted aspect that, um, you know, that doesn't mean that you and I can't share a beer and bullshit and laugh about stupid shit after this and all that yeah. and still not at the same time like also care about the environment and these social causes and all these things we're multifaceted humans 100%. it's okay to be all the things dude absolutely right? that's like, that's the key yeah yeah because that, 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 that's like true authenticity it, it, you know and that, that's really what it is yeah. yeah broad i totally agree with john courage very important i think a conscious leader has to have compassion mm-hmm and it has to be able to see himself and that other person and that person inside themselves. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't feel compassion for the people who oppose your beliefs and who are sitting on the other side of the aisle when it comes to the things that you're disagreeing on, you're never gonna create change. And for me, that's what it's all about. It's like, we have to love each other, like John said. We have to be there for each other and we have to support each other even if we hate that person's ideologies. Yeah. Because that's the only way that we're going to create heaven on earth. That's the only way that we're going to create a world that's better than the one that we're living in now. Yeah. Because if we continue down this path, it's going to be more division. It's going to be more anger, more frustration, and more of the things that we don't want to see. Yeah. And we're more in common than we think. Yeah. You know, even, the, even the person that you think you have the most is, is on the farthest end of the political spectrum. I guarantee you, you have more in common with them than you do any politician. Mm. And it's just becoming aware of that, getting people together, having conversations. Yeah, and there's an interesting call to action out of that, outside of obviously checking out Change for Balanced Productions and all the epic stuff you guys are doing, is think about someone that you feel that you're on the opposite end of stuff right now and reach out to them. Like, go grab a coffee, go grab a beer with them and see what that's like instead of avoiding the shit out of them, which totally. is what we typically do, you know? Especially, we saw that during COVID. We saw families being ripped apart. Yeah. You know, so if somebody, if you, if, if, if you have a, a rip in your family, heal it. Yeah. If you have an old friend that said something about vaccines that pissed you off, mm -hmm. squash that shit. Yeah. You know, go extend your hand to that person and <laughs> go grab a beer, you know? Yeah, 100%. I love that. I like, love that. Well, guys, keep doing what you do. Absolutely love what you do. So keep being you and, and changing the world one video, one form of content at a time. Love you guys. You, brother. Love, Love you too. You. You're killing yeah. it, Seb. Thank you. Guys. Hey guys, I really hope you enjoyed that episode. You know, it takes a lot to put these things together, but I truly love doing it. If you enjoyed this episode or the show in general and you listen to it on audio podcast, please take some time to give it a review. It would really mean a lot to me. And if you watch the video, please go ahead and just click subscribe and share it with somebody that you think would like it. It would really mean the world to me and it helps keep the show alive. Visit SebastianNom.com for more content and follow me on Instagram at sebnom, that's S-E-B-N-A-U-M.
Thanks again for spending your time with me. I know it is valuable. I hope you have a great rest of the day and week. Till next time.